would like to share a little something with all of you. I draw this from, and I am probably mispronouncing this, so I apologize if anybody knows the correct pronunciation, but this comes from Lama Surya Das, and the Jochen, the innate great perfection. And this is part of Al Rappaport's book, Buddhism in America. And if you get an opportunity, it's a wonderful book. It's, it's filled with short essays. And he tells us that while many ask how to meditate or how to become enlightened, they do not consider what to do with enlightenment when they achieve it. The integration of what is learned is more important than enlightenment. And satare, or enlightenment, means awake. And I often ask this question, and I'm sure many of you, as well as others, ask the same question. What does it mean to be awake? And we can only reply with awareness, our awareness. Expand our awareness. Be more in tune with your environment. Be more in tune with yourself, especially with yourself, because our culture reflects what we are. And if we see division in culture, in our society, then many of us are divided within. And it is that unification that must come first before any other unification can occur. And I want to Thank you for allowing me to share that little bit with you. We're going to you. talk a little bit about the science of continued life and reincarnation. And we're going to start with something from Herward Carrington in his book, Your, Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. Now, this book was published some time ago. I think it was in the 20s or, or 30s, maybe even earlier than that. And he tells us that there have been many contradictory teachings about the continuation of souls or the continuation of life. And the United Kingdom, well, guess what? You know how people are in the United States. They they like to, to be different. So naturally, what did they do? They disagreed. <laughs> In fact, they disagreed so much so that the National Spiritualist Association made it a crime in their organization to teach reincarnation. Imagine that. And we know how important that is, because the only thing spiritualism does, the only thing mediumship does, is demonstrate that it happens. It's there. They communicate with these souls that move from this plane into the next. And the theory, we're going to look at just the communication right now. Or not the communication, I'm sorry, I should look at my notes more often. But the where it came from, this whole idea of the continuity of life. Because it is one of the oldest beliefs, probably the oldest belief. And in fact, it's what religion, the whole concept of religion, is built upon. And this belief came about through the most simplistic of events. It's no more complicated than, well, we've got spring coming up. And what happens in spring? 
Okay, that's that's your opportunity to speak up. <laughs> Renewal of life. Renewal of life. Exactly. And the Egyptians, I've got it on good authority that the Egyptians base their whole concept of the continuity of life. In fact, a lot of their early religion, before it got tampered with, was all about nature. And when we look at nature, when they looked at nature, they noticed that some of these plants would kind of drift off, go dormant, appear to, appear to die. Some of the animals as well. And what happened a few weeks later? 90 days later, thereabouts. Well, they're back at it. So the continuity of life is, it's just a natural event. It's part of the system. And their idea was, and I like this, I like this a lot. Their idea was that you have not departed dead, but you have departed alive. Think about that. Departed alive. Now, some of the early teachings, the uh, uh, Eleusinians, I believe, even some of the Dionysian practices and Bacchic practices, their thoughts, their thoughts were that the soul was imprisoned in the body. Imprisoned in the body. What are your thoughts on that? Let's 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 think about that. What do you think about that, Beth? Actually, I, I, I like that idea. Um, I've always been fascinated with other, the ancient mythologies. And I just, I just think there's just a lot of truth in there that, um, that's just uh, alien to, you know, Western thought. Quite frankly, I think it holds us back. Um, but I like that idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, it just fascinates Which idea? me. Excited. It's like, oh, I can't wait for this physical body to die so I can be free. <laughs> I can be free. I can go zooming through the universe like I used to do. I miss oh. that. Oh, <laughs> like you used to do. Wait till we get further into it. <laughs> yeah. But, but imprisoned implies trapped. And I think that having this physical experience gives you an opportunity to grow and learn and develop um so I, i'm not comfortable with the idea of being trapped i'm more uh interested in the idea of it being an opportunity to experience and at some point when the vessel becomes worn out i can i can get rid of the old clothes so i can uh try on new clothes exactly you saw my notes, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was eavesdropping. <laughs> that's that's very good because one of the things I liked about what they had to say with the soul being imprisoned was not the idea of the soul being imprisoned or entombed in this physical body. What I liked was their thoughts on how the soul developed itself because the soul they say develops itself through philosophy now some people will turn their nose up at that word and think "Ooh, it's just a uh, i want no part of that but what philosophy is about is it's all about question in the line of questioning you can think of it as being a little selfish because it's all about what is best for you. This whole idea of, of the soul being imprisoned. Ray presented us with a philosophical view of that, a philosophical summarization of that. 
Because the way I see it, well, if my soul is imprisoned, it's not doing me any good. What good is a soul? What is good is anything that is imprisoned. So you begin to examine, you question, well, what kind of prison is this? Well, it's one that I experience life through. It's, well, it is an experience. But then again, you know, I've got all this crap I have to deal with. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's all this, there's all this food. There's all this wine. There's all this partying and everything. Well, there's all these distractions. Well, are these distractions? See, that's what philosophy does. It encourages you to question, what is it that's best for me? So the soul is looking for a way to, to grow. So what are your thoughts about that, Sharon? Um. Everything you, I mean, all the things that were just said, they're all absolutely part of it. Um, I can't say it's always, it's not always an easy, easy road. And, um, but, you know, if we weren't imprisoned, we wouldn't necessarily go through the, put ourselves through these things. And I hate, and I don't, can't, can't say I really like the word imprisoned either, but if we, because as far as I understand, we make these choices of where we want to be. We decide before we come here, this is where we want to be for a reason to learn the things we need to learn. So, you know, imprisoned is, you know, whether, whatever you call it, we're here. You know, whatever, however you want to word it, we've made this choice. So, um, you know, we have to, we can accept it and learn from it, or we can fight it tooth and nail to the end, I guess, if you, if you really, you know, if you want to push it and say, oh, well, I'm, uh, you know, I hate everything and I hate everybody and <laughs> They make my life miserable and blah, blah, blah. Or you can work with it and move on. And um, so, yeah, kind of, I'm, that's kind of where I feel too. Um, we don't know a lot of things for a good reason. You know, we don't know necessarily what, what's going on for, for the right. And you know, we may want to know, but I, I'm always drawn back to the, to the principles about, or the seven spirits about not needing to know the timing. <laughs> that's, that is the, that's the one that sticks with me constantly because I want to know the time. <laughs> I, I don't, I know I don't need to, but I want. So. Here's a question for you and, and you don't give me an answer, but it's something for you to consider from a philosophical vantage point. And that would be, why would I choose all of this? Because the interesting thing that comes to mind, I was reading about this in, in some of my other re uh, research, and the idea with destiny, when we hear that word destiny, it's like, why bother? And, you know, destiny to me is like a plan. So if I'm up there planning out my life down here, I'm not comfortable with that. Because where's the fun? I can just sit back and, and just be on autopilot and go through everything because it's all laid out. I laid it out for myself. It's just something to think about. I like I, uh, well if I might just say I I don't think that it's quite that laid out and I would I would say in my mind that there's a 
there is a general plan, but my free will is what decides which which road I turn down, which direction I turn down. I still have free will. I there may be a a bit of a there may be a plan to some extent, but I'm the one who's calling the shots. Very good. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Good job. Thank you. Didn't she do a good job, Ray? (laughs) (laughs) Good job. And what are your thoughts about that, Sandy? Oh, I forgot what the question originally was. But give me some thoughts anyway. (laughs) Well, we we spoke about the word the term imprisoned, and I guess I I like kind of felt like everyone else that it just it just kind of had a connotation of an of an of negativity but um and and in in a broad sense but um um that you're stifled or you're confined um but my my view of it more was that one was deeply focused i guess my feeling is that and instead of being imprisoned you're you're just simply focused on certain things. And it went back to what Sharon said about the plan. I, I guess I thought of it more as just as an overview. You know, I'm sure we all have an infinite number of things that we have to learn and grow from and uh, work through in our spiritual journey. And obviously we can't have them all in one lifetime. So the focus would be on you know, the the certain things maybe that we feel are the most important to focus in this lifetime, I, I'm assuming, I don't know, but I guess that's where um, I felt like the focus was, was maybe more um, fitting. And, um, and then, of course, like Sharon said, we all have our free will. And, uh, and I think I, I look at that uh, you know, we, it's, it's an overview. We have, we have the overview of, of what we may have, uh, settled on and our focus, but again, we make the decision whether we're going to go path A, path B, path C. It's all, you know, it's just all going to depend. Um, and, and you said, but I thought, I thought it was kind of funny and cute what you said about, um, just kind of, sitting back and going with the flow through it all. And the thought just occurred to me, well, that's probably true, but you know, we, we do have some fun too. <laughs> you know, There's some fun along the way and memorable moments and happiness. So um, that that's the plus. I think that's the, the plus side of it. You know, that makes what all the difficulty we have to bear bearable, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Sounds good. I don't Sounds know. Sounds good. And Rachel, what are your thoughts? Well, um I guess when you talked about uh the term imprisoned, um I I thought of I I completely agreed with Ray um in everything that he brought with that but um i also thought uh i suppose that the body can start to feel like a prison when it stops cooperating you know i i think of a friend's aunt um that had ms and she could only really blink at the end and so I think that the body can start to feel limiting when you've got any kind of health crisis mm-hmm. or it stops cooperating with you <laughs> in different ways. Um, you know, it can limit your freedom and uh, some of your experiences here. But um, I definitely think that there are experiences in the physical that we can't have in the spiritual. And um, that's why we have manifested on this plane, you know, to experience and learn and grow through 
those physical um, experiences and sometimes limitations. Good insight there with uh, with your friend's example. Good insight. So the body can sometimes seem like a a prison, and I myself had a brush with that when my brain did its thing, because I never knew what shape I was going to wake up in, and a lot of the freedoms had had disappeared. But I don't want to. I don't want to go off into that one. Into that, uh, and here's another theory about the continuity of life. And this comes from this is the survivalist hypothesis that's presented here. And this is more on a scientific thing. And he asserts that the continued post mortem existence of a formally living agent. And that observable evidence of this continued life is found in the table tipping, message work, and other soul phenomena that supports the theory. So the question with this is, comes well, the question that came to mind to me was that, does this mean that after we die, the only thing left to do is to talk about it? <laughs> Talk about everything through all those other people that are still here. After all, all these things that he he's listed here, the table tipping, our message services, trance, uh, automatic writing, all of that is these other souls talking to us. Makes me wonder if that's what I have to look forward to. But fortunately, Fortunately, science has something else to say about that. Are, is, is anyone familiar with the author Ian Stevenson? All right. He wrote several books. He, is, uh, uh, he took a scientific approach. I think he was a psychologist. I don't remember offhand. But he took a scientific approach to exploring reincarnation. Now, this person had a lot of respect from the scientific community. And he demonstrated the validity of reincarnation. He developed protocols in which to test the theory. And he did it through past life remembrance, not past life uh, uh, regression, but past life remembrance. And what he did was he talked to children between the ages of five and I think maybe ten. And he found that that is the right time for them to remember past life experiences. Because after that, the brain, through its normal development, begins to close that access off. And it makes sense, because it would be very difficult to go through life remembering something two or three lifetimes ago, and getting it confused. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that appointment was next Thursday when it was actually Thursday in 1920, in August. Imagine how confusing that could be. I mean, I'm confused enough. I forget these type of things all the time, but to get it, oh man, that would be horrible. But he discovered that they can remember these experiences quite vividly. He also discovered something else. Some of the birthmarks that people have can be representations from a previous life. He discovered that some of these birthmarks represented how the person died in the 
previous life through a fire being a large scar or or a knife wound or other things like that. He also discovered that some of the malformed limbs that some of us are born with may also represent traumatic events from a previous life. And I may not recall this correctly, but he wrote about a person who who was mutilated and in the next life the person was born with evidence of that mutilation so he he presents something worth looking into uh, the uh, whole idea that reincarnation is just not not a myth or anything like that. And he's got several books, and a lot of his studies were in Western Europe. And at the time, the idea of reincarnation was not very prevalent. And he discovered instances of reincarnation in that culture there, which makes it very significant in and of itself, because reincarnation is taught a lot through the Indian cultures. So here's a question for you. Is reincarnation mentioned or alluded to in the Bible? Any thoughts? There was something about John the Baptist being Elijah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. So, it's there. We're always looking at nature. Or rather, I should say, I'm always suggesting that we look at nature. And nature demonstrates a lot. As Ray said, the whole idea of the body being a prison is, well, it's just ridiculous. Yes, it can, can seem like a prison at times, as Rachel pointed out. However, when we look at nature and what nature does, Nature is all about growth. It's all about evolution. It's, it's all about refinement. That's what evolving is. It's refining. So if we continue to look at nature, then the whole idea of reincarnation is a natural process. In fact, Stevenson even proposed that there was some form of attractor that was drawing us through this process. Nature also demonstrates cycles. Everything in nature occurs in cycles. The rainy season, the dry season, the winter. We've got all of these cycles. So it would just make sense that the soul spends time on this plane with a body. The soul spends time in another plane without the body. And if we continue with that progression, eventually the soul and the body are going to find a way to coexist in both elements. Of course, if we continue with with nature, there's also the possibility that they will become separated again, and the whole process renews. But we don't know that, so we're not even going to explore that. But the, what I wanted to bring to you was how nature, how nature can explain some of these perplexing 
ideas that are introduced. And the one thing to keep in mind about those earliest religions, their origin was nature. Everything was based on nature. Beth, what are your thoughts? Oh, just that I agree. Yeah. You all know how much I like to get my hands dirty in the <laughs> soil. So, you know, I feel very at one. And I'm out in nature. I like to hibernate in the winter like a bear. <laughs> <laughs> feel renewed in the spring. So it just makes a lot of sense to me. All right. Very good. And and Sandy, what are your thoughts? I I like the um connection to nature. I I guess I hadn't really thought a lot about that, but um I do I do I do like it and it makes perfect sense. It makes it it just aligns perfectly with what we're talking with reincarnation what we're talking about. Um um yeah, I, I'm just thinking how I always look forward to spring, but I always look forward to fall, which I don't know why that came to me, but I guess the cycles have their own uh, inducements or their own their own enjoyments. Um, but yeah, I I uh, I do I I like that, and and there was something that came to me earlier, and I just have to share it that when my grandmother was alive. Um, she used to talk about it, it, what, just what Rachel was saying about as we get older and we're, um, uh, our bodies don't cooperate. And she, she was getting up there and she felt her limitations ser severely. She felt that limitation and she couldn't wait, uh, to go so she could do just what Beth said to just soar. She just wanted to be free and soar the universe. And a friend of ours who just passed, Bruce was a medium and he told me after she passed that normally you have to have a little period of rest before one can do that. And that she was really fighting that <laughs> she had no intention of resting. She wanted to go. So just a little story. It just was so funny when you said that, Beth, that made me think of my grandmother just soaring and loving the freedom of not having that physical body. So just a little side story. Sorry. But anyway, I, yes, I, this is, this is great. I would love it if we could talk about this more because I think it's, I, I, I just, I think it's a great subject. Yeah. I hope we can, we can talk about it some more going which, forward. Which topic? Re reincarnation. Reincarnation. Yes. Okay. Yes. I will keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good, good. And Rachel, what are your thoughts? Well, um, I had a few different thoughts as you were speaking on uh, some different topics. You had brought up uh, pondering, you know, what the afterlife is like and if we just focus on the living. And um, it brought to mind that uh, medium that I, uh, that really first was one of the first mediums I was kind of exploring and introduced to James Van Prague. He talked about, um, you know, going through a type of review after you pass and the Akashic records and reviewing your, you know, your different lives and what you accomplished in this life. And then classes, so to speak on the other side that you can continue learning and, different um ways and venues there and so that was you know an interesting thought to me as well as um how you could create you know whatever home you wanted of course with mental constructs and um but you know and you need a physical tongue to eat an orange so um that as well as some other things might be what you missed about um having a physical body 
Uh, and when you were speaking about Stevenson, um, I'm not sure if this documentary was related, but years ago I did see a documentary um, where they showcase different um, young people. Um, and one boy in particular really stood out who, you know, had detailed descriptions of the planes that he flew and um, the names of the planes. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe war details or something I, I, to that effect. I read his book. Oh, he wrote a book. They, his mother, his parents wrote a book about him. It's, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but um, yeah, he, it, that was, it was an amazing story. Amazing. So at South Pacific, his plane went down in the South Pacific and he, um, his name was James. And his former life, his name was James, which was really amazing. But yeah, I yeah, his story yeah. is really, really. And I, there is a documentary. If you go on YouTube, um, it's called, oh my gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can tell you the name of it when I think about it again here. But uh, um, there's a documentary on YouTube about, up tube about it. And then he wrote, the parents wrote a book about him. He said, grown man now but um, it was a really amazing story what he told um, he actually met adult men that he served with when he was 20 mm. years old when they were 80 in their 80s yeah it was wow. really something so yeah yeah anyway sorry you didn't mean to interrupt Rachel but yeah, that's a good, it was a good story, so. Yeah, I'm glad that you remembered um, that boy, yeah. Probably got it on my bookcase here, but I, <laughs> I just can't, because I, I bought the book, I, I really liked it, so. Yeah, I was really taken with his story, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a, uh, another thing that came to mind while you were talking was that there is a, a psychologist who started to compile um, regressed hypnosis um, accounts. And uh, now I'm forgetting his name, but I've got a book by him somewhere around here. But anyway, yeah, so there's the... Uh, like you said, Sandy, lots to explore and it's a fun topic to, to dive into and learn more about. Was his name Brian Weiss? That sounds familiar. Um, for some you... reason, I'm, yeah. Go ahead. For some reason, I'm there seeing in my head several. a G and a, a V and a, in in the last name hmm. but i know who you're talking about too i believe he wrote a book many lives many masters yes i did Very read that one book. also and i he was a psychiatrist i believe okay mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and i gave um i gave that book to my grandma when she was um about to transition she had bone cancer and she seemed to get some peace from that. Ah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm reading a book on holography. Actually, it's called the Holographic Universe. And the author mentions two or three uh, psychologists that were compiling information, and I'll. I'll go back through it. I, I haven't been away from that part too long, so I should be able to find it. And I'll see what I can do about finding uh, uh, information about them. Yeah, that'd we've be got fun. A fifth, we've got a fifth Sunday coming up in May, maybe, and I'll maybe I can schedule a video mm. on some of that. So I'll make a, a note to myself. Yeah, I don't know that'd if be I can neat. remember where I put it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Reverend Phillip. Yes. Um, I have a question. You, you know, when you are uh, bringing people through to communicate, um, and then we're talking about reincarnation, um, those people obviously have transitioned over but have not come back. Um, I, is there, this, is there, I mean, some, I would imagine there's a very, there's a, um, considerable difference in the amount of time the soul stays on that side before it transitions over. Um, so if you're communicating with those that have transitioned, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that time exists outside of the physical plane. I mean, I don't know that there's such a thing as time on that side. So, if there's not the time they spend there, could feel like an instant, or it could seem like an eternity. Um, it's. I mean, if you communicate with somebody that was has transitioned a hundred years ago, versus somebody who was transitioned two months ago. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in, um, I, I was of the opinion that when you transition, there's some resting period or some period of adjustment. Um, but I, I, don't know, I don't know that that's true. I mean, if you, uh, um, Sandy mentioned Bruce who passed just a few weeks ago. Now, on this side, a few weeks ago is not that much time. On that side, a few weeks ago could be infinite. So I'm, I'm just curious uh, what you feel about, is, is, there, is there some period, in that transition process, is there some period of time that elapses before you're prepared to try put on a new pair of clothes? Well. To begin with, I'll, I'll share what I've read, and I don't recall where I read it from, but it was, it was one of the Buddhist uh, writings, and they had suggested 150 years between incarnations. Now, within spiritualism, what I've also discovered is that those souls, the information they bring to you, specifically on topics like this, what they bring to you is is typically according to your belief. Now, my own personal thoughts are that we have these multiple lives. They all exist at the same time because there's only the present. And if there's only the present, then they all exist at the same time. And because they all exist at the same time, we're connected. Now, if I were to apply some of the scientific theories, one of them would be the holographic theory, which is that, you know, everything is frequency. Everything is light frequencies. It's just matter is merely a, a compression of those light frequencies. And within these images that we see is a record of the whole. So within my fingernail here is a record of the entire universe. Well, that's one theory. Um, what I was told in a dream when my during my brother's transition period was that there was a time frame for us to acclimate to our new location now was it specific no it's not specific those people who can transition very quickly or prepare for it have less of an acclimation time. One of the things that Andrew Jackson Davis tells us is that when we go on a trip, typically we get maps, 
we find out what the culture's like, we find out what the weather's typically like, you know, we do our research. And he recommends that we do the same. We prepare ourselves. Even the Buddhist writings that I've read, they tell us, they instruct us to prepare ourselves for death. To see death as, again, the transition point, as leading into something else. And they describe this great darkness that we move through before we are on the other side. So everybody has a different description. And the only thing I can do is bring these ideas to you and encourage you to consider them. But I'm not going to tell you which one is correct and which one is not, because it's a matter of personal preference. And my preference is that we all exist at the same time. All the versions of myself exist in the present. And since I can only feel a cat brushing against my leg in the present and not next week or last month, the same must hold true for everything else. I look to nature as much as possible and go by what nature demonstrates. So, so I don't know if that helps, Ray, but I, I, I actually I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope that helps. Well, it raises other questions, like if, 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 as you say, we all of our lives exist in the present, then does that not challenge the idea that you live this life to um, learn lessons so that um, you move more towards the source and in the next life, you refine those lessons. But if our lives exist instantaneously, then, of course, I'm thinking along a timeline. And in, 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 your, in, in your theory, there is really no timeline. There's only the present, um, which kind of refutes the idea that your existence today is intended to... Um, refine those lessons so that in your next life you advance um, because if everything is instantaneous there's no opportunity for your past life to inform your present life which is really kind of mind-boggling <laughs> <laughs> um, one theory is that there you are um you are concentrated in an oversoul that is projecting its energy into and time is like an onion rather than a linear line and you're projecting different rays of your energy into different lives and bodies and times in that onion and everything is happening simultaneously, has already happened, is happening in the future, and is happening now. I don't fully comprehend <laughs> all of that, uh, you know, with uh, my linear brain. But so that's one idea. If, that, if that's true, are we not already mm -hmm. at the source? Yeah. Very very good. Very good. Because uh, everything... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I was just going to throw out there. Uh, similar thoughts are introduced in a um, documentary called What the Bleep Do We Know? Have you guys seen that? Uh -huh. um, and it talks about some of these... Uh, some physicists are on there talking about... Uh, some time and space concepts. So anyway, I'll throw that out there. Um, one, everything that I have read indicates that we are the source. Rachel is the source. Ray is a source. And everything emanates 
from outward from us. For some, that's a bit of a stretch. The other thing is this mind-boggling realm called the quantum field. And mind is non-local, but the brain is. And because of the brain, we're only able to perceive this reality. However, if nature is all about evolving and refining, then eventually we reach this quantum brain that is able to perceive everything essentially at once. So, so you're correct, Ray. It's it uh, 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 it's mind-boggling. It raises a lot of questions, which is good. I feel that is good. And again, it comes back to personal preference. It's the Sometimes. wonderful thing about beliefs. Yeah. I was just going to say, sometimes I have dreams that I am someone else with people I don't know, living in a house I know is mine or in a place that I'm, you know, even in the dream, I remember being there several times before. And sometimes I think maybe I'm visiting, an, you know, an alternate concurrent reality. I don't know. <laughs> Try having that happen in real time. Mm. Literally waking up and, oh, okay, I'm here now. <laughs> that's, that's caused me to question everything that I had thought I knew and to reshape it into a different theory, which includes the ability to shift from one type of existence to another type of existence, which makes it even more mind-boggling. I mm -hmm. haven't even explored that one yet, but that comes down to the multiverse theory, which is reality stacked upon realities. Mm -hmm. So there's so much to play with, so much to play with. And did you have any more thoughts, Ray? No, that's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sharon, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Um, that was really interesting, all of that, I have to say. That I'm so glad you met and asked the question because I think it's it's something that we haven't even really talked about before so quite so much. So, um, but the other, there was one other thing when you mentioned about, you were talking about nature and all of that. And just the idea popped in my head that as, as human beings, we, we do tend to gravitate to nature for renewal. I mean, we, we take a trip to the mountain or and even in our meditations, we talk about the mountain a lot and going to the mountain and renewing there. So as, as a, as an example, so even in our physical life, when we hike or we take a trip to the mountain um, and Thomas going to the Grand Canyon and all of the things that he does for his spiritual well-being, um, it's a, it's a great um, analogy, I guess, is what I'm looking for, but we, you know, we, we do that. As a, as a species, as human beings. So that's our kind. And I know a lot of us don't get to do that in our life. A lot of people who are stuck in cities and they don't ever take a vacation or they never are able to go anywhere and see other, other alternatives. Um, and I find that kind of interesting because uh, you have people that are just so, so connected to nature and other people that are so not, uh, that are just very much 
you know, day-to-day -day physical life, urban life, you know, they just don't see it. Sometimes then, I wonder, know, go ahead. Sometimes I've wondered if we're balancing each other out as parts of the whole. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, just an observation. It's a good observation. And, you know, we moved into areas that I would not normally present because they're so abstract or mm -hmm. so esoteric. We're working through through her talks, Book of <laughs> Knowledge, and we've made some wonderful discoveries there. So, but, uh, you know, I want to thank all of you. And just leave this little bit with you. I probably mentioned it, but uh, Stevenson was convinced of an organizing principle within the process of reincarnation. And because of this, it suggests that reincarnation is part of the overall plan because we we humans do so like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for your thoughts, your participations. It's it's wonderful. Thank you very much.